Amen. Is that the cry of your heart tonight? To know him? It's all about knowing him. Nothing's better than your presence, Lord. Oh, let, let us drink deep tonight of your presence. Let us drink deep of you tonight, Lord. Reveal your word to us tonight, Lord. Reveal your truth to us tonight, Lord. We want nothing less than your truth. And we want nothing more than your truth. We want you, Lord. We want to know what you have to say. And as I was um, thinking about um, what it is was to share on, the Lord said, well, what's the passion of your heart? <laughs> the passion of my heart is to know him. So the, the um, title of this message is Created in His Image. Uh, during the time of Yom Kippur, which was last September, um, I decided to take some time and seek the Lord because, you know, Bob Jones and Bobby Connor and Paul Keith Davis and those guys all seek the Lord for the coming year around that time on Yom Kippur actually every year. And they always encourage us to do the same thing, so I wanted to do that. So as I spent some time with him, with the Lord, um, I made sure uh, that I wasn't listening to any other prophetic words and I wasn't reading, you know, what's coming out on Elijah List or, or any other thing like that. The only, the only thing I really was reading was the word and maybe a book study that we were doing at the time I which one it was, um, because I wanted to hear for myself what the Lord was saying. Um, and um, some of what I heard is what I'm going to share tonight. Um, and specifically, I heard this, uh, that God's people will begin to take on more fully his character, his likeness, reflect his light, walk in an unwavering plumb line truth and live the crucified life. That's a pretty tall order right there. Let me put this someplace where it's... <clears throat> um, but it's about time that we stepped into that place um, as the church, as the body of Christ, into everything that Jesus gave his life for on the cross. So... Um, Proverbs 23, 23 says this. Buy truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. And many Christians don't want to know the truth because they'll be confronted with things that are going to challenge them. And they don't want to take up their cross because it's just too uncomfortable. It's just comfortable to stay right where we are. We don't want to face things in our own lives that, that need to be changed in order for us to look more like Christ. Um, anyway, a lot of people just don't even want to make superficial changes to be more like Christ, which is pretty sad. And the thing is, we don't automatically become like him when we're born again. We don't automatically have a renewed mind. We have to renew our minds. The word tells us to renew your mind. Um, so we have to continually make choices to walk in a manner that defines who we are as children of God. Because we are people who are set apart. We're not of this world. Uh, then I, I heard that his people will realize Christ in them, the hope of glory, and begin to access the treasures within and release Christ to the world. That's pretty good. Um, and imagine if all the church walked in the fullness of Christ. 
Christ. What a different world we be living in right now. Even if half the church walked in the fullness of Christ. Then I heard this. Be careful who and what you listen to, as there will be many who speak in half-truths, and there will be many who speak words that sound like wisdom, and many who will tickle your ears with what you want to hear. So be wise and be aware. Colossians 2.8 says this, Many persuasive arguments and clever words will try to entice you and lead you astray. Endless arguments of human logic, humanistic and clouded judgments based on the mindsets of this world system and not the anointed truths of the anointed. So as the scripture says, we need to be wise as serpents and, and harmless as doves. We have to be discerning and trust God's word that says that his sheep know his voice and follow it and don't follow the voice of a stranger. And the way we know his voice is by knowing him. So be alert to the day and the hour that you're in. We must be as the sons of Issachar knowing the times. In Luke 2, 56, Jesus said to the crowds gathered around him, When you see a cloud forming in the west, don't you say a storm is brewing and then it arrives? And when you feel the south wind blowing, say a heat wave is on the way. And so it happens. What hypocrites. You are such experts at forecasting the weather, but you are totally unwilling. Unwilling to understand the spiritual significance of the time you're living in. It's critical to know the significance of the spiritual time that we're living in. Not only in the natural realm, but even more importantly in the spiritual, in the spiritual realm. And we, and we really need to be aware of our own spiritual state. Where are we spiritually? And are we working on it? We, we do need to be nurturing our spirit, man. And we do that by being in the word and exercising the gifts. So during this time, I've been in the book of Colossians for a couple of months, just reading it over and over again. And I couldn't seem to get out of it. And around the same time, um, our friends Debbie and Carol gave me this uh, CD series by Graham Cook. And in the series, he talks about um, when God highlights a particular scripture and has you meditate on it for long periods of time. Uh, they call this an inheritance word. And what that means is that the word will set you up to discover what you're going to experience during the next stage of your journey of faith, which I thought was really cool and that you need to take hold of it and make it a part of you because that's what God is wanting you to do, make it a part of you. It's like you're eating the word by just reading it over and over and over again and making it a part of you. And Colossians is a book about the hope that lives within us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's a book that encourages us to access the treasures of our inheritance from the heavenly realms. It's about maturing in the rich experience of knowing God in fullness. Um, Christ is our message. And revealing Christ is our message. Um, it speaks of our union with him and that his resurrection from the dead is our resurrection too. And it talks of our life union with Christ and that the manifestation or word of God will live richly in us, flooding us with all wisdom, which sounds really good. But God wants us to take hold of these truths. He wants us to take a hold of all the truths uh, in his word. And if he's highlighting anything to you in particular, I would really take heed to that and really meditate on it and eat it because he, re he is wants to make that particular word at this particular season in your life a part of you. He wants you to just um, begin to live it and live in it. Um, okay. 
So it's no mistake that each of us is living during this time in history. God is very intentional. Acts 17.26 says this, From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. The Passion Translation reads like this, He sets the boundaries of people and nations, determining their appointed times in history. Cool, huh? We have an appointed time to us on earth, very specific and very intentional. God placed us in this time in history on the earth for a purpose. So know this, you were born for such a time as this. We were all born for such a time as this. There's a plan and a purpose for our lives on this earth at this time in the history of time. This alone should cause us to be in awe of God. So I believe one of the most important things we can do to be spiritually prepared uh, and to fulfill the call on our lives is to become like the one in whose image we have been created. Jesus is returning for his glorious bride, one with whom he's equally yoked, a bride who has prepared herself and her bridegroom, uh, for her bridegroom, and one who is like him in character and nature. And Revelation 19 speaks about that the bride makes herself ready, so we have to make ourselves ready. We have to prepare ourselves. It's not an automatic thing. We just don't automatically become clean and renewed in our minds. And we don't automatically look like Christ in our character and nature. We need to prepare ourselves. There's this amazing uh, passage in the book of John, chapter 17, verse 18. And Jesus is praying to the Father. And he says, I have commissioned them to represent me, just as you commissioned me to represent you. Wow. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. Jesus has, has commissioned us to represent him on the earth. That's pretty heavy. And then I, I started to think, well, how, how do you represent perfect love? Because that's who Jesus is. He's perfect love. And uh, the answer came back. You become like him. Hence to know him and to become like the one in whose image we've been created. Um, there's there's going to be a lot of scripture in here in this teaching because to truly know God, we need to know his word. His, his word transforms us. So this the scriptures that I'm going to read right now are... are are scriptures that speak the call for us to be transformed into his likeness. The first one is actually the, the scripture that this uh, England of Ministries is based upon, and it's Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Think about that. Sila. I mean, really meditate on that. Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And you could just eat these words. First John 2 6. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, 23 and 24. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which, in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. All these speak of 
how we are to look like God, the one that we've been created uh, to look like. Ephesians 5.1 Follow God and imitate his ways in everything you do, for then you will represent your Father and his beloved, as his beloved sons and daughters. Imitate him. And 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lamb, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So how much do we look like the Christ that lives in us? How much do we represent him in nature and in character? I'm serious. How much do we look like him? And how much do we work on it every day? On becoming more like him? And knowing him, we get so busy in everything that we do, in our day-to-day -day activities. Do we make him a part of everything that we do? I mean, he's living in us, so you would think, you know, that we would. So, eating and sleeping and working and getting our day-to-day -day things completed shouldn't be our top, top priority. Pursuing a passionate, unrelenting, moment-by-moment -moment relationship with God should be. Living for him each day should be. Determining to know him and become like him should be. Like when we get up in the morning we should say, you know, how can I represent you today, Lord? Or, you know, what will we do together today, Lord? Not, oh, I've got so much to do today. Oh, I've got to, oh, i got to get to work. Oh, I have an appointment. Oh, I have, uh, you know, I've got to go grocery shopping. I've got to do this. i got to do that. Um, that shouldn't be what's on our minds when we get up. What can I do with you today, Lord? How can I represent you today? Because we're not of this world, so we shouldn't look like this world. We, we should be distinguished, distinguishable as followers of, followers of Christ. We, we should look different. And, you know, look different in, in how we act and what we do, the things that we do, and how we live our lives. But also, you know, the more we become like him, the more light that comes from us. And people can see that light as well, you know. They can see Christ in us coming out of our eyes. And we don't even have to say anything. That's how it should be. 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16. We Christians have the unmistakable scent of Christ. I like that too. We smell like him. Discernible alike to those who are being saved and to those who are heading for death. To the latter, it seems like the deathly smell of doom. To the former, it has the refreshing <coughs> fragrance of life itself. I love that. We want to look like him and smell like him. We want to be identified with him. And at the end, I'm going to play a song that speaks to all of this. So how do we become more like him? Well, I just have a few points of, uh, that the Lord gave me um, that we should focus on to become more Christ-like. And um, the first one that he he gave me was conviction and repentance, which is so important for us to have. The conviction of the Holy Spirit and the true repentance that brings um, about transformation, not just the, oh, I'm sorry, and then you go and do it again. 
a true repentance, which, um, well, the full defini definition of repent is to turn from sin and dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life. Um, Strong's defines it this way, to repent is to change your mind and to change the inner man. Repentance is a sincere turning away in both the mind and heart from self to God. So that's true repentance. John 16, 8, oh wait a minute, yeah, 16, 8, says, when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict the world and show where right and wrong and judgment lie. He will convict them of wrong. So, I would say that if we're not being convicted, we should be worried. We really need to, you know, to be receiving the conviction of the Lord. We should desire and welcome the conviction of the Holy Spirit on our lives. Not, it's not for condemnation, it's for correction. In order to become more like Him, and we need to remember that His Word says that He... He corrects the, those that he loves, those who belong to him. So we need to welcome it, even look for it. Um, you know, when you get that little nudge of something that you're doing might not be right, that, there you go, there's a conviction right there. Um, so that conviction requires a response. How will you respond? We... <clears throat> We should join the psalmist in saying, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. So when we're convicted of sin in our lives and sincerely repent, the word says that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So being cleansed from unrighteousness brings transformation into our lives and brings righteous living. It's a choice that we make. So conviction and repentance are very important to become more Christ-like. Of course, Jesus didn't have to repent because he was sinless. And you know, when we do repent, um, and he forgives us and cleanses us. He it says he forgets our sins. So no sense bringing them back up again. Because he's, he's, as far as the east is from the west. Um, another important point for Christ-likeness is to walk in the fear of the Lord. This one has been... <coughs> The Lord has really been working with me on this one a lot. Um, and I love it. I really do. Um, there's not enough of it in the church today. People have this really casual relationship with the Lord. Um, Bobby Connor puts it this way, that we are way too familiar with a God that we barely know. Because we become very familiar, we forget his awesomeness, what an awesome God he is, what a fearsome God he is, what a just and righteous God he is. You know, he's, he's tender and he's terrible. He's the lion and he's the lamb. Uh, Proverbs 1.7, and these, these are some scriptures now in the fear of the Lord, and there's a lot of them. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise wisdom instruction. I don't want to be a fool. Psalm 1, 11, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. I, I really like this one. Psalm 25, 14. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. And he makes known to them his covenant. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. <coughs> Proverbs 4, 
Proverbs 16, 6. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for, and by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. So without the fear of the Lord, many will not turn away from evil. Those with no real, real fear of the Lord are those who go on sinning and believing it's okay because God will cover it with his grace. That's really a gross misuse of God's grace. Um, those without the fear of the Lord have little or no conviction of wrongdoing. So there's no turning from sin. There's no transformation. There's no becoming more like him. Psalm 34, 9. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. These are some really great promises. Proverbs 19, 23. The fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm. Psalm 147, 10 and 11. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. So he takes pleasure in those who fear him. And lastly, Isaiah 11:3. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear. And this is actually speaking of Jesus, the root of Jesse. So, if his delight is in the fear of the Lord, how much more should ours be? And the fear of the Lord is not something um, where you feel like you have to hide when, when God approaches because he's a big scary father. The fear of the Lord is more uh, of an awe, um, a reverence, and an honoring of the Father. And I, I believe it's an honoring of things that he holds sacred to his heart, that, you, that we want to hold sacred to our hearts as well, to please him out of love, not fear. And I also think the fear of the Lord is where we recognize that this great God, the uncreated creator who created all things, the heavens, the earth, the cosmos, all of it, created us in his image. The uncreated creator who created all things, created us in his image. That's pretty amazing. Because he wanted family. He wanted friendship and companionship. I think this should cause us to be awestruck. To me, this was a Selah. So the fear of the Lord. Very important for us to walk in that fear of the Lord. If, if you feel like you don't have it, ask for it. It's really important to have. Uh, and the, th the third thing was uh, to become like him, we need to know the word because he is the word. John 17, 6b says, Jesus says that those that the Father has given him out of the world have fastened his word firmly to their hearts. And that's what we have to do. Fasten the word firmly to our hearts. We have to eat it. It's got to become part of it. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So to know the word is to know God, because he is the word. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So to be in the world will help us to recognize when we or others are operating out of the soul or spirit. 
and it helps us to discern even our thoughts and the attitudes of our hearts. It helps bring the conviction. <laughs> James 1.22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So we don't just read the word, but we live it. Ephesians 5, 26 and 27. For he died for us, sacrificing himself to make us holy and pure, cleansing us through the showering of the pure water of the word of God. All that he does in us is designed to make us a mature church for his pleasure. Until we become a source of praise to him, Glorious in radiance, beautiful and holy, without fault or flaw, a bride fully prepared for him. Sila. These are all Silas today. Psalm 119.11. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Knowing the word keeps us from sin. <coughs> Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So his, his word shows us the way and it keeps us on the straight and narrow. We need that <laughs> because there's a lot that, that will entice us to walk on the wide road. A lot of stuff looks really good. I, I don't know, I find that the, the more that I know him and the more that I'm becoming like him, that road is getting narrower and narrower. It really is. And then Revelation 19, 13. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. To know him and become like him, we need to behold him in his word. We become like that which we behold. And we need to keep our mind on things above more than this world because we're not of this world. And I can't say that enough. We're not of this world. We're not of this world. We're not of this world. We have to remember that we're not of this world. We live in this world. We're not of this world. I think that we've lived as a part of this world for so long. I think so many people have that they've gotten lost in it. They've gotten lost in this world. They can't see the forest for the trees. They can't see heaven. They're our true home. The realities of heaven for us are so critical. And I heard Rick Joyner say just recently that the more the realities of heaven are to you, the less of a pull the world has on you. And I believe it's true. The more we become like Christ, the more we have our focus on heaven and on the Father, as he did. And the more real heaven becomes to us, and the less of a pull the world will have on us. And this is backed up in scripture, Colossians 3, 1 through 4. It says, Christ's resurrection from the dead is your resurrection too. This is why we are to yearn for all that is above. For that's where Christ sits, enthroned at the place of all power, honor, and authority. Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the distractions of the natural realm. So it's time for us to live more from that realm that we came from, and not so much according to the worldly realm. We have to keep it before us. John 17, 1. 
Father, the time has come. Unveil the glorious splendor of your Son. And when I read this, what I heard is, I really believe that this year the Father is unveiling once again in a new and fresh way the glorious splendor of his Son for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. I believe that as we read and seek him in his word, that it will be opened up to us and we'll be able to see him as we've never seen him before. He longs for that relationship. And he wants us to know him. I'm convinced of that. And I really feel that one of the greatest honors that we could give him is to return that honor is to have that same hunger for him and for relationship with him that he has for us. Um, and I've heard it said that it's not so much what we do for him that determines our place in heaven as it does how much we become like him. God is love. This book by uh, Patricia King, The Bride Makes Herself Ready, um, she's actually quoting uh, Rick Joyner in here. She said, in Rick Joyner's book, The Final Quest, he envisioned various positions in heaven that were assigned to believers according to devotion and service. All who were in heaven were happy to be there, even the ones on the outer fringes. But Many had remorse for not serving the Lord fully during their time on earth. They were positioned for eternity depending on the fruit of their lives while on the earth. And uh, the bride's heart is revealed, tested, and proven while she's on the earth. So I started thinking about the, the fruit, um, you know, our our place in eternity is determined um, by the fruit of our lives. And so I'm thinking, well, what's the fruit? Is it how many converts? Uh, you know, how many mission trips we went on? You know, what, we, what we've done, what works that we've done for the Lord. And this is what I heard. The Word of God says that the fruit is love, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, love, joy, peace. That's the fruit. And because that's what Jesus looks like. He looks like all those things and that's how we should live and that's what we should walk in. And that's the fruit that we carry in. And seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Um, Everything else comes out of that, that we would do. But it's not the works that get us in, in closer to him. Um, okay. And I just wanted to read something quickly from this. So it will be filmed by you. Francis, Francis Frange Payne. And I mean, his, his whole life is about Christ-likeness. That's, that's what he lives for. Um, and that's what he teaches, how to become like Christ. And just this little blurb, he said, even as we seek God for our needs and intercede for the needs of others, as God's seekers, our highest goal is to become Christ-like. Because we could do we could do lots of things, but if we're a clanging symbol, I guess if we're not, uh, if we don't move in love, and God is love, and become more like Him. So Christ-likeness is uh, our highest goal. So, if you should have thoughts of 
of your own unworthiness in the light of this amazing commission um, that he's given us to represent him, consider this. This is also from the Days of His Presence by Francis Vangelin. Do not fear or think of yourself as unworthy. Of course you are. We all are. It is for his glory that we are being prepared. He made no mistake in choosing you, just as he made no mistake in dying for your sins. He chose to put his spirit within you. Personal unworthiness is not a valid excuse. Your destiny is God's decision. Beware lest your sense of unworthiness become a smokescreen of unbelief. The darkness, chaos, or emptiness that may still exist in your life is not any more of a deterrent to the Almighty than the terrible pre-creation void that awaited him in the beginning. Certainly, your individual genesis from darkness to light shall not be too difficult for God. Even now, the Holy Spirit is descending, hovering, and brooding over you. To your new creation self, the voice of the Lord commands, arise and shine. Shake yourself from the depression in which circumstances have kept you. You are standing at the threshold of God's glory. Amen. Determined to look like him, smell like him. Um, I'm going to play a song. <laughs>